Hello and welcome everyone to today's final Adapting in 2020 webinar series. We'll wait a couple of moments while everyone comes on to join, but while they do, if I can ask you to open your chat function, set it to all panellists and attendees, and just type in there where you're joining us from, um, or your name, and where you're joining us from. So we've got, uh, there's three Melburnians on here today, myself, Tim, and Tracy, and we've got Yana joining us from New South Wales. Laura from Melbourne, welcome. We hope, Laura, you haven't been been blown away in this crazy um, wind. So we'll just wait a couple more moments. Do use the chat function to join in the conversation uh, or ask any questions as we go along with our panellists as well. And for those who are joining us, you may be familiar with my usual um, construction work outside. So if you hear any noises throughout, it will just be a bit of jack. But we might get started. As I said, this is the 10th and final in our Adapting in 2020 webinar series, and it's fantastic to have you here. My name's Georgie. I'm the Chief Engagement Officer at Fetching Events and Communications. And before we get started, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And that's particularly significant during these times because we are coming together from lands all over Australia. And I know we've got some people joining us from overseas, so I'd like to pay my respects to their First Nations people as well. So this is being recorded and it will be sent out following the webinar. So if there's anything you miss or you'd like to catch up on, just let us know. So as I said, this is the 10th and final in our Adapting in 2020 series, which Fetching events started back in late April, early May, when our worlds all got turned upside down. And it's been great to bring experts together to run webinars and help in the areas of communications, event management and volunteer engagement. For those of you who are returning, thank you so much. It's great to have you here again. And for those joining us for the first time, welcome. It's wonderful to have you join us this morning. So if you've missed out on any sessions, I will post a link in the chat function at the end, along with a link to how you can get in touch with each of our panellists um, if you want to know more about what they've been speaking about today. So for today's session, 2020 has certainly forced us all to rethink, um, to review and re-look at how our volunteer programs are running. Oh, wow, we've got someone who's just started three weeks ago in volunteer management. Welcome, Alex, or started the role in volunteer management. So this very much is about sharing ideas and insights and helping and strengthening our volunteer engagement and leadership sector, because the more we can collaborate, um, the stronger our services can be. So I'm thrilled to announce our speakers and welcome them and introduce them to you today. We've got Tracy O'Neill, Manager of Volunteer Engagement at Austin Health. I should say Tracy O'Neill, CVA, and she's going to tell us a bit more about that during the um, discussion. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. We've got Tim Ryan, CEO at Lord Sunless Camp and Powerhouse. Hello, Tim. Hi, hey, Georgie. And Jana Vanderlich from Event Teamwork, um, who's a volunteer engagement specialist who we're thrilled to have on board. One, welcome, Jana. Thank you. So as I said, don't forget to pop in any questions or comments you've got as we go, and um, we might dive straight in. So as we know, volunteer, volunteering is changing, but it's been changing for some time and I know that's no surprise. We've often been working with old models of volunteering and trying to fit it with new styles of how people want to volunteer. And often it's like putting a, a square peg in a round hole. COVID has provided an opportunity for us to evolve um, and look at how we can really improve and focus and streamline the way we work. Studies have shown, and in fact, you know, this has been going back even 10 years, that volunteer trends are changing. Longer term volunteering has started to change toward episodic and shorter term volunteering. Time driven volunteering has started to move towards cause driven volunteering. And the brawn volunteer, so the doers, that old style sort of working bee, um, all hands on deck, um, filling bodies in roles, is moving towards more the brain volunteer and how people can contribute with their skills and knowledge and insights. So today we're gonna to have a chat to people from various um, organizations and sectors about how the last six months has impacted them and 
how it's changing the way they're looking at volunteering. So Tracy, we might start with you. Sure. Um, working in health, which is obviously has its own characteristics, particularly in a global health pandemic, 2020 has certainly changed how your programs worked. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you've been impacted? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess being a health service, and I work for one of the, the largest core health services in uh, Victoria, Australia, and um, I guess we are one of the lead, um, which has only been announced yesterday, public health units, but we've been one of the lead um, hospitals in treating COVID patients across um, our particular area in Victoria. So we closed down our program um, at the end of March, as many programs did, suspended most of our programs. We've been really lucky that about 15% of our, our team have been able to continue. Um, all of these in virtual roles, um, beside two volunteers, which I'll touch on in a sec. But um, I guess those roles that we that were already working in a virtual capacity or that we were able to transition quite easily, um, we were able to do that. We have no face-to-face -face roles with patients. Um, once we step out of this kind of um, stage of restrictions, we will have uh, one volunteer a day back helping um, to guide visitors around the hospital and couriers mostly. <laughs> um, but I guess just trying to, to um, make sure people get to where they need to go quite quickly without a lot of um, interface with other people. Um, so that's meant a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the personalised care that volunteers offer in a health service has been stopped. Our patients, I think, are really suffering. You know, they, they don't see many people unless it's people that are treating them and even then they're all gowned up, um, which has been one of the real disappointments. And we've had to close our op shops and gift shops. Um, unfortunately, one of those actually had to close permanently because it was a rented space and we weren't able to continue making money in that space. So we have had to close one of our op shops permanently. Um, we've, I guess, tried to transition um, a number of our roles and create some new roles. Um, and I guess one of the challenges that we have had working in a, a health service in particular has been getting the leverage off other teams that we need involved. So IT, for instance, you know, um, to make sure that volunteers have access to the platforms that they need. IT's priority has been getting 9,000 staff transitioned to a whole new virtual platform. It's been creating new setups for patients to have video consultations and to connect with families. So um, I guess they've been some of the biggest, um, the biggest challenges. But I guess the thing that I've learned through this in terms of the impact has been you know, the biggest thing you can do is come with solutions, um, you know, rather than saying, help, this is my problem, or this is what I want to do, I want to, you know, create a virtual role. I've found we've had more success when we've been able to come, you know, say to IT and say, these are the two, um, the two ways I think we can solve this problem, we can use this platform or this platform, these will be the risks involved, this is how I think we can mitigate them. Um, and at least then people can get back to me um, with, you know, um, their ideas and suggestions and how we can tweak things rather than them having to come up with solutions themselves. Absolutely. And how it's, let's step back to, say, February this year. How many volunteers would you have on site per day? Oh, per day. Oh, God. So you're, so you're now down, you're looking at one volunteer per Yeah. So day? We, we what would, are you... What, oh, Gosh, across I think that probably three, gives us an idea of how yeah, many. Look, we have three campuses and um, and two op shops. So I would say, on average, we would have anywhere between kind of sixty and hundred volunteers yeah. a day across all of our sites. So down to yeah, one one a day, um, face to face. So how do you, you know, I guess that sort of the process that many people have gone through is that okay, we've had to shut things down. Like the first one was about safety and. That was the priority in communicating to people that you know programs aren't running, that sites are sh or elements of sites are shut down. Then, when you start to look at okay, how do we evolve this onto virtual or things like that? What was the process you went round of which roles can we make virtual, which ones can we evolve? How how did that sort of process work through? One of them, we were really lucky. So our most successful uh, virtual program has been um, a telehealth support role. Um, we were lucky to be um, have been piloting that role with one volunteer for the last um, 12 months. So we have about 280,000 outpatient appointments um, at our health service every year. 
And last year, 583 of those, I think it was, um, were conducted by telehealth. Uh, so a video consultation between patient and doctor. Um, Many of those people were in regional areas. So we have a number of statewide services where we're the, we have the, the specialty um, and the specialist doctors here and teams. So it was many of those uh, kind of patients or patients who were too unwell to travel from regional areas. At kind of start of COVID, 80% um, of those 280,000 appointments have had to go virtual. Um, and so we were able to scale that roll up really quickly because we already have some investment from a couple of staff. So that was amazing. A team of 13 volunteers has now contacted over 2,500 patients in six months to support them to set up their devices um, and to feel confident to kind of move into their very first video consultation with a doctor. So that's been phenomenal. Um, the other, I guess the other thing has really been about... <sighs> It's been a time when it's been important for us to connect with the champions in our organisation, those people who really get volunteering and see the benefit of volunteering. So it's not been the time for us to think about, you know, brand new, fantastic, amazing ideas because people in my health service do not have the capacity to deal with anything new. The one thing we know that, our, that is missing from our service is that personalised care. And so the other idea that we've really been able to leverage is to look at um, virtual companionship by volunteers. That's not quite off the ground yet because it's one of the IT glitches that we're waiting to get through, but we have huge support from our staff to have volunteers engaged um, in virtual companionship roles because, you know, so many patients are so isolated, mm. so lonely. Um, so it's been about really, can, you know, identifying those people and, again, coming with the solutions and the ideas so that we can actually get something off the ground as quickly as possible. Yeah. And you said something so important about the, the telehealth one is you already had investment for some, from some of the team members. And as you say, you need those champions. And when in health, the, the primary service isn't volunteer-led. Um, so that can be a challenge, and particularly during a pandemic when there's so many different priorities. How, and, and you've talked about coming to the table with solutions, which I love that because people don't want problems, they want solutions. Have you found, you know, if you, you thought of sitting at your desk 12 months ago, would have you ever imagined some of these new services or evolved services running? Do you, has it sort of taken this shift for people to say, oh, actually we can do this in a different way? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We have a very traditional model of volunteering here at my organisation and it's something that my team and I are working really hard to challenge. Um, you know, one of the things that I've said to all of the CEOs who've been here at our organisation is volunteers aren't some pretty fluffy thing over here that make us look good. Volunteers need to be engaged in an organisation if the organisation truly believes that they are an important resource to achieve our, our strategic priorities and our mission. Um, you know, so I guess it, it's been it, 12 months ago, I would have said we were, we were, you know, pushing things uphill really to get some of these ideas off the ground. Um, we have a really innovative team. We have a phenomenal team of volunteers with exceptional skills. And it's been really tricky kind of butting up against this really traditional model where, where a lot of senior staff see volunteers as an other over here. They provide something complementary, not necessarily critical to the service we deliver. So I, I think it really has shifted some perspectives, particularly when you look at, um, you know, how important that human connection is to the care that we provide. That's become really obvious. So um, I've actually um, loved this year. I've hated many parts of it. Don't get me wrong. It's been the hardest year in my life. <laughs> But what I have loved is the opportunities that this year has, has provided to really dream big and to think outside the square and to really challenge people's perspective of what volunteering is and can be. Um, and I really hope that our team can push this. I really hope that our team just refuse to engage with any conversation about traditional models of volunteering because we're going to, you know, we're not going to be... Um, of any use to the organisation because volunteers aren't going to come along for the ride. So Tracy, someone, you know, listening today who's perhaps working in an organisation where further up the chain that priority and 
importance and understanding of the value that volunteers bring to the organisation. What advice would you give on how you communicate and liaise with those different departments to get them on board and get them understand that, as you say, it's not the volunteers who are this group, you know, having a fun time over here. They're actually an integral part. And I love you always talk about, you know, including the volunteers in your head count and, you know, they are a part of the organisation. They're not just this little department that's having a, you know, wonderful little time over here. What advice would you give to people on how to yeah. get people on board and, and bring those management um, people. So I think I think the first thing to say is recognise it can be a really long journey. Um, yep. and I've been at my organisation for eight years yet. There, there's been no radical changes. Um, there's been lots and lots of little changes, um, which add up, don't get me wrong, things are definitely different. Um, so there's probably, there's probably three things that I would say that are really simple um, and it's important that you're consistent with them. The first and the most important to me is be really mindful of your language. Mm. Use language that strengthens um, the way people see and um, value the impact that volunteers can have. So, um, you know, talk about <clears throat> volunteers as being part of the workforce. I know in my organisation we've talked about this, Georgie, uh, yeah. volunteers are still, by some of our senior leaders, not seen as part of the workforce. When yeah. I talk about volunteers, I talk about them as part of the workforce. I talk about having one of the largest workforces in this organisation. <laughs> Um, I talk about my team. We're not volunteer managers or volunteer coordinators. We are leaders of volunteer engagement. We don't coordinate people and put them here and put them there. It's not our job to get people and kind of <clears throat> put them somewhere that might help someone else. Our job is, is to be the conduit between, you know, an organisation who someone has passion for uh, about their cause or the actual organisation and someone who has some amazing skills and, you know, compassion and empathy to give and to want to make a difference in someone's life. So, you know, talk about what you do um, as volunteer engagement and all the really important things that come with that. Um, don't let people use the word just. Stop yeah. anyone you hear. Yeah. Yeah. They're just a volunteer or if they're oh. making a cup of tea or they're just stuffing an envelope or they're just planting a tree. You can, no, no act that a volunteer does Need, deserves a just before it because they're yep. truly making an incredible difference. I was only having this conversation yesterday with my team about um, using the word skilled volunteer and pro bono and, and how as a sector we should really think about dropping those terms and that language because every volunteer who comes to us comes with skills. You know, yeah. I look at my volunteers who sit and talk to a patient who is actively dying, you need experience exceptional people skills to be able to do to be able to do that not everyone could do that um, in a way that is going to change that person's experience in the moment so you know I think language is really important the second thing is just what I said before find your champions don't waste too much time on trying to change the mind of people who don't get it because we need to show people and so engage with those people who get it and who value your volunteers and let people see, wow, look at the difference the volunteers are making over there. I want a bit of that. Um, and I guess the other thing is about really sharing the impact that volunteers can have. Um, and by this, I don't mean number of volunteers. I don't mean hours that they work. I don't mean, you know, it, it's about being able to tell the stories that your volunteers do to change someone's life, to change yes. the moment, to make a difference. Yeah. Um, because... That is the power of volunteers um, and it needs consistency. You need to do all of this stuff all of the time in every interaction that you have and it's tiring, um, but that's how you kind of chip away at things. Exactly, and that consistency and that use of language is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, when people talk about the volunteers, it just immediately generalises a group of people who Stop. all come from various walks of life, with various life experience, various skills, insights, new ideas, fresh outlooks. Yeah. And if we start seeing people and try and get our teams to see people as individuals rather than this generic group of people that will yeah. come. A part of a workforce, you know. Exactly. Exactly, exactly the same as someone who's paid for the job. Well, you know, you're delivering yeah. the same kind of impact that someone exactly. who's paid for yeah. the job. Yeah. So, Tracy, before we move on to um, our next panel, so I just want to quickly talk to you about CVA, and I might get you to explain to those on the 
the call who don't know what CVA um, is and tell us about sort of any trends you're seeing internationally with volunteering. Sure. So uh, CVA stands for Certification in Volunteer Administration. It's an international designation for leaders of volunteer engagement. Um, it's very big in the USA and Canada. Uh, it was established as an international designation, but um, I guess hasn't been taken up outside of um, the countries where it was established um, so much. Um, and it's a, a way of actually demonstrating um, expertise in applied knowledge um, in volunteer engagement. So uh, for me, you know, I, I explored the certificates, uh, I explored kind of the opportunities that are available over here, the diplomas, um, and a lot of that was educating people how to do volunteer engagement. And I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. And, you know, I have a colleague um, who did do her certificate and got recognised prior learning for 11 out of 12 units, you know. And so the time she invested was really to get a piece of paper to say, yeah, you know what we're teaching you to do. For me, this was, I guess, my biggest passion at the moment is um, connecting our sector globally. Um, I, I think that for, particularly for volunteer engagement in Australia, we've been quite segregated. For us to really level up, we really need to be a part of a global sector where we are able to draw from the expertise of people right across the world and acknowledging the context of different government legislation, funding models, all that kind of stuff is very different. But at its core, volunteerism is, is exactly the same. Yeah. So, and, and Oh, sorry. oh, no, sorry. So, so I guess the CBA is a, is a designation that, that Ange Sy from the YMCA and I decided we would like to do to actually start um, being able to connect with and share expertise with leaders across the world and to be able to demonstrate that we have this level of expertise um, and that our organi we hope that our organisations start seeing us um, yeah. for the leaders with the expertise that we have and, and acknowledging the difference that we can make. Um, you know, to the outcomes of our organisations. Right. And I mean, one thing that COVID has presented is so many opportunities to join overseas meetings and webinars and conferences. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you say, connect, we need to collaborate more and, and that COVID has sped that up. I think people previously have perhaps seen, been worried to share their IP or worried what might happen or worried to give too much away. But over the last six months, people have worked probably together more than they, you know. Ever. And I think the opportunities that, it, that, that it's created is phenomenal. I mean, we've chatted. I, I, I've spent the last couple of weeks attending network meetings for professional associations from all over the world, um, you know. And one of the opportunities that has come out of that for me is to be able to present at the Texas Volunteer Management Conference next month. Like, how would that ever... I would never have the money to fly to Texas to present yeah. at the conference. But the fact everything's happening virtually... I've made these connections globally. People see my expertise through the fact that I have, you know, a, a CVA. Um, all these amazing doors are being, are being opened through the opportunity to connect virtually with people. So, yeah, I say just jump on any opportunity you can. Join the chats, join the network yeah. groups, watch the webinars, email people on LinkedIn. It's, um, there's a phenomenal community out there. Fantastic. And we'll post at the end of the webinar links to Tracy's blog, uh, as well as links to find out more about CVA. Thanks, Georgie. So moving from health to um, another organisation that is heavily, um, I guess, you know, in volunteers are integral to this organisation in the running of programs, uh, is Lord Sammer's Camp and Powerhouse. Tim, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Georgie. And hi, everyone. Um, now, volunteers, and I've spoken to you quite a bit, are, are such a key part of delivering your services and your camps and um, your various activities. How has the last six months changed for the way your volunteers are involved? Well, our, uh, our, our volunteers aren't just integral. They're, 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 um, we're a volunteer-led organisation in, uh, in a lot of ways. So uh, the support function the support office provides is, is purely that, to provide the support to the volunteers to allow them to concentrate on the work that they do. Um, now, the work that they do has been heavily impacted through, through COVID. We've gone from running incredibly physical, uh, active uh, camps and programs, uh, you know, preparing breakfast, lunch and dinner, uh, you know, multiple days through, through the week for 
uh, up to 500 uh, attendees at, uh, at, at any one camp, um, which is quite a, quite a mean feat. And, uh, you know, hearing, hearing before uh, Tracy speaking about uh, uh, skilled volunteers, that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the exact nature of the volunteers that attend our camps is that they, 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 they aren't experts on, uh, on cooks uh, or, or cooking or chefs or, or running games and activities, but they really come with an absolute passion to, to make a really big difference. And, um, and that's what we, we like to encourage when they come down and is that they'll be involved in, in multiple different aspects of, uh, of running a camp or a program that they wouldn't do in, in their normal everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's, uh, that, those breaks have uh, have literally been applied to to how we run our programs thanks to uh, our friend COVID, mm. and uh, and and that's that's not just breaks uh, for a short term program that's that's breaks on programs that have been running for decades long. Mm. Uh, I mean we're an organisation that was founded in 1929, uh, ultimately on the on the back of uh, removing social class barriers and and bringing communities together to celebrate diversity. Um, and, uh, and, and partly in, in some form of a silver lining, I think that's what COVID has done on a, on a, a global scale, has really forced us to you know, remove uh, barriers of, uh, of class or, um, uh, or, or diversity and really made us uh, open our eyes up to celebrate uh, that we are one community. Um, that, that, that being said, we can't do our normal programs uh, like, like we have done, but our volunteers have come together in a, in a working group um, to look at ways that we can keep our, uh, our spirit going uh, and an appropriately named working group called Keeping the Spirit Alive, where they've, uh, they've been workshopping a, a number of different ways to, to keep that, uh, that spirit moving. Fantastic. And Tim, I, I was so impressed with how quickly Lord Summers moved your projects online and I remember saying to you how did you do it so quickly and you said because we got the volunteer team who would be running these camps involved in the design process because they're ultimately the ones who'll be running it they work with the the kids that you work with they understand what they want how they operate and um, you got their buy-in straight away which I loved what was the biggest lesson you learned in that process of um, redesigning these programs and having the people who would be on the ground running them involved in the design. Yeah, I think I think we were um, uh, uh, fortunate in 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 some ways that uh, we uh, I've I've said it internally uh, that it was almost like we were supporting our volunteers through a grieving process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once uh, once we had to cancel our programs, and and I'm immensely um, humbled and proud of the way that we focused our. Uh, our efforts around uh, health and safety for all of our participants. We work with some of um, you know, the, the most marginalised and, and disadvantaged uh, uh, young people. Uh, so that being the centre of our decisions, uh, you know, certainly really proud of, uh, of that. And uh, ultimately, one, one of the things that uh, we were able to achieve is working with some of our uh, um, uh, support office staff to activate their leading role through that, through that period and, and having the ability to run uh, uh, just, uh, just silly little things virtually, just mm -hmm. so that our volunteers and our participants knew that we were still there for them uh, and, uh, and, and ready to support. So we, we did uh, uh, a Lord Summers quiz and, um, uh, and, and cooking shows and pass the ball and all, all these you know, novel little things online. And, and, and they weren't game changers, but they, were, they, were, they, were there, they, they drove a purpose. Yeah. And that was there to make sure that our volunteers knew that we were there to, to, to support them through. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think one of the bigger lessons as well was really just uh, really identifying the need to care for our staff and volunteers through that. Um, you know, understanding that, that um, you know, that they, they needed their support uh, as much as the participants that we generally support uh, through this time. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, probably tying all that in together, and I think, uh, I think you said it before, is, uh, is collaboration is just key. Uh, you know, seeing the collaboration with our volunteers and, and that of other partner organisations has been uh, really humbling. What has surprised you the most? Um, you know, working with your team over this last six months. Uh, just, just the, um, uh, just, just 
it's it's you know I think collaboration is an easy ro- word to roll off the tongue, but actually acting on that is yeah. is quite another thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that 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 has honestly surprised me. Seeing the the continued collaboration efforts with our volunteers, uh, breaking down silos of other organisations that um, uh, uh, in a really positive way that we. Our vision is to create a stronger, more inclusive society. Uh, and for us to be doing that on our own uh, is, 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 you know, a big mountain to climb. Uh, so I think that collaboration um, opportunity with a number of different uh, organisations that share, you know, in some way that same vision has been something that, uh, you know, has really surprised me. Fantastic. And you've obviously done so much work and communicating well and engaging with your volunteers over the years that they have that shared vision so that when you come to a time like this, it's easier to move forward together because you've all been there from the start. And and you're so right with collaboration because often groups of people are invited for their feedback, have your input, but then another group goes off and runs with a completely other idea and the person's like, well, why did they even ask me for my idea? And then you you disengage with them. So it's, collaboration has to be authentic it has to be meaningful not every idea obviously is going to come up but talk to people about why you chose the you know new program idea that you did so they under they feel that they and understand that they're listened to and that they're, they're valued it's not oh, I wonder whatever happened to that meeting that we had you know a month ago we were all asked to put our ideas out so I think that's something that can kind of get missed in you know people go oh we'll collaborate but it's not meaningful no Indeed, you know, I think, um, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, it's important as well to have some measured, um, you know, expectations on, on those. And like I say, not, not every idea is the best burning idea move, moving forward, but it's about hearing and, and, and working together at, uh, at identifying, okay, well, there is, you know, some really great um, opportunities to move forward. Uh, you know, we're, we're delighted with uh, some of the initial stuff early in, um, in, in COVID with uh, Rock Around the World where we, we yeah. had, uh, you know, seven, eight other charities participate with us to try to virtually step around the world. Uh, and, and, you know, that goal wouldn't have been achieved without, uh, without multiple uh, organisations uh, helping to be involved. And, you know, we're, we're immensely excited to turn our premier um, um, programs into things that we can continue to connect online with. And it's sharing the success with the team too. Uh, know, it's, back it's, the, the difference they're making. Um, it, it, exactly. I, I think sometimes we 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 uh, we're so busy we move on to the next next thing and and you know uh, put my own hand up here that we sometimes move on too quick without celebrating all the successes and yeah. you know we've got an AGM coming up uh, on on Monday and you know it's a really good time to reflect and and just seeing some of the things on one page yeah. of what happened in the last six months you think well if what what if, is there a pandemic on it uh, yeah. doesn't look like it but you know you've got to look back and think. Okay, far out. We've, as a as a community, uh, you know, I think humans have an innate ability to adapt and uh, and embrace change. I mean, you know, we've come come a, a long way in in, in uh, evolution, and as the, our programs need to do as well. I presented at a conference uh, yesterday, and I think some of the delegates might even be on the call here. And one of the plenary speakers put it perfectly about saying thank you. She said, you say thank you when you get your cup of coffee in the morning. But to people you're working with, it's thank you for, or thank you, and you put context into why you're saying thank you and add value so that they understand, you know, the difference they've made. Um, It's not just a blanket thank you. You know, it comes into sharing that success. So what does the future look like for your volunteering roles, Tim? And I guess you've probably gone through the process of the immediate pivoting um, way back when. Now you start to look, okay, coming out of this, or, you know, moving into the next phase, perhaps, how are you looking at your roles? You know, can, are you sort of looking at them for the next six months, three months, 12 months? What's the process you're working through at the moment? Um, uh, look, pl- planning is all, all, uh, all, all, almost uh, impossible at, at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, you know, there, there, there is some vision that we can continue to, uh, to connect with our, <coughs> our volunteers. We're, we're, we're um, also largely funded by our own social enterprise, which is running fee-for-service uh, camps um, for, for schools and groups. So we have some, uh, some hopeful optimism that there's a return to, to the camp setting. I think it's immensely 
valuable uh, uh, double positive for, for kids to participate in camps, but uh, you know, for, for their own mental health and, and, and future endeavours, but, but also helps us fund the programs that, uh, that support the disadvantaged that might not get that opportunity. So uh, a, a lot of work is being put into uh, you know, covering off our, uh, our you know, the right policies and, and cleaning and, and all of those type of things. So that's, that's a, a, an immense immediate focus, but uh, we, we're also continuing with that collaborated effort at the powerhouse building uh, on Albert Park Lake, where we're working with our uh, with our uh, function centre operator and, and partners there at doing an outdoor dining uh, concept to you know connect uh, people back into um, society in in a, in a lot of ways for for all those that I'm uh, that are listening from Melbourne will will very much understand that and I'm sure those in the state uh, see it from afar as well uh, so we're really excited to to have that space open up and I think there'll be a really great opportunity to connect some of our uh, uh, charity partner organisations um, to do, you know, uh, a very special kids day in the park, uh, you know, exclusive uh, and, and safely um, managed or a Mirabelle family uh, day or all those type of things to slowly connect and, and, and partly say thank you uh, to, to bridge on from what you're saying, Georgie. Thank you to those, um, those partner organisations and our volunteers for um, uh, sticking true and, and, you know, running with our values in a very difficult time. Do you think, Tim, there'll be any volunteer roles that maybe won't move forward because you've realised you can work more effectively through a different type of role? Or are you sort of the particular roles that you're re-looking at and reshaping based on um, sort of the opportunities that COVID has brought up? For, for us, all of our focus is, is very much um, <clears throat> uh, creating connection. Uh, so by, uh, um, you know, uh, if, if anything, we would like to continue to grow where, where we have been in the past and, and, and only look forward to, to um, you know, filling those buckets. So you know, but, but our organisation is, you know, really is focused and centred around um, supporting our volunteers. We, we want to ensure that that continues. I think the efficiency comes from uh, volunteer uh, committees not needing to drag themselves, you know, after work to a particular destination to sit around a table. Uh, I think there's some good silver linings with, with that. And I know, you know, I mean, our volunteers um, contribute about 135,000 hours every, every year, which is, uh, you know, the equivalent um, uh, of in kind of about $5.6 million to the community. Um, uh, so for us to be able to show some efficiencies for them to, uh, you know, um, uh, focus on their own mental health and their own families as well. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest silver lining that will come out of this. Yeah. And that's so important about supporting them and having their back. And, you know, if they're now meeting via Zoom, not saying, well, now that restrictions have eased, you go back to meeting in person about what's working for them. And I, I am working with a, a sport organisation at the moment that, you know, members are spread all around the state. And one of them said to me the other night, I can't believe we used to travel so far for committee meetings when we could have done it online all along. So it's it's not making people go back just yeah. because we can, but actually looking at what's the best things that have come out of the last six months that we can take forward. I, I think I think the door on the first committee meeting might get uh, beaten down. <laughs> have the opportunity to connect out of Zoom, but uh, but I think that very much it will still keep a place uh, yeah. moving forward. And it'll be about what works for them, not what just we've what we've always done. And exactly. I think so many organisations get trapped into that, but we've always done it that way. That's just mm -hmm. how it's done. But let's, you know, relook at that. So we've talked about it, you know, we've spoken to Tracy in health, Tim in a volunteer led organisation. We're now going to move to the world of events, big events, <laughs> mass participation and so forth. And and Yana, thank you so much for joining us. Yana has a, a long history in working in events in volunteer engagement. What are you, and events is kind of a whole nother ballpark um, about getting back. Um, what are you seeing, Yana, at the moment around how events are considering the involvement of volunteers? Well, thanks for having me, first of all, and hi, everyone. Um, I think the, well, events, as you say, are in a very different um, situation, I guess. Um, I work with both community organization and large scale events. And I think the 
interesting part was how community organizations didn't stop. Um, most of them actually became much busier, various events um, or camps, um, as for Tim, um, actually stopped completely. Mm. And um, the impact on the organization was quite different. Um, but I think what events can learn from organizations that have kept going, like we have now heard, is how, how quickly they have adapted and, um, and found the silver lining and, um, you know, made things work and how it was actually very positive to change that whole thinking around volunteers where it before, in my view, was a lot around, yeah, there is a volunteer program and it was kind of considered the same for everyone. Um, whereas through COVID, a lot of, um, especially community organizations, had their own challenges and worked through their own challenges as we just heard um, and really realized how their volunteers are supporting them to create their impact um, and really align that much better, which is exactly what um, I find is missing in a lot of the larger scale events where the volunteer roles are often very operational task-based um, so people are engaged for tasks rather than for the impact that they are making mm -hmm. by participating, yeah. which is a very different conversation. Very different. And, and, and for those task-oriented ones, they're often down the pecking order until event yeah. time comes. And without the volunteer right. workforce, the event can't run. And suddenly they become a priority, but it's too late then. Um, you have to have had, they've had to have been part of that decision-making process not the volunteers themselves, but the volunteer department, that decision-making process along the way. You work with, and like sort of Tracy was talking about getting champions on board. You do a lot of work sort of further up the chain um, to shape that, uh, I guess, understanding of the value of volunteer workforces at events. Do you want to tell us a bit about how you go about, you know, shifting that um, mindset yeah it's um it's tricky it's yeah. tricky um like because um like you said before um things were always done like they have been done and um it kind of works and we just keep it going because there is a certain risk in changing things um and so the beauty that i see in COVID is we were forced to change and forced to rethink and and I think what a lot of people realized is there is things that are actually working so much better, like online training, for example, or online meetings or working from home. Um, now that doesn't necessarily work for event volunteers, um, but there is things that can be incorporated. And yeah. I think the main part is to realize um, that they are a big part of the community and a big part of the organization um, and they, just as much as the suppliers and the, um, the other stakeholders, I guess. Yes. Um, and what happened to the, to the event community was um, because everyone kind of stopped and went down. Um, so everyone was affected and there was this big community kind of coming together and talking about, oh, this has happened and we need to talk, we need to include everyone and again, I think the volunteers to a large part were left out of that. Mm. Um, but there is a great opportunity now to realize, oh, they're actually part of our workforce. They are part of our events. We can't actually stage our events without them and to embrace that more and include them in the engagement along the way. Mm. And now so, build the volunteer roles more aligned to yes. the organization, more integrated. Yes. Because there's, there's always a trick with events where the, the headcount isn't always captured correctly. And, uh, and I know this when I manage workforces that I sometimes am given a roster and told this many volunteers are coming on and I'll say, but what are this group doing? Oh, well, they're just spares. No, yeah. you, don't, you know, but these people have taken a day off work. They've arranged a babysitter. They've driven two hours to volunteer. And then we have nothing for them to do because people didn't do the planning properly at the start. And so it's just this reactive sort of thing. So now is the time, even if events are unsure whether they'll run or how they'll run, can still be looking at your volunteer program 
um, and how you can, you know, it's, it's about not working harder, but working smarter. And I think that really does that. And, and a couple of things you said and that, that Tim and Tracy have talked about too is around language. And really it comes from us. Mm. We have to position ourselves and the value and the importance of volunteers project that because if we if it doesn't start with us we can't expect you know someone to sort of go oh you're doing a great thing here uh so you know in all your for everyone listening in all your conversations think about the language that you're using how you're demonstrating what role your workforce are playing in the organization um i mean lord summers are very lucky to have a, a, a champion in their ceo who understands um, the value but there's a lot of organizations who don't um, you know, if you talked about sponsors, that'd be way up the pecking order. Yet the people doing all this work, facilitating all these programs, but we've got to put that across. So think about the language that you use. Yeah. Yeah, I think the um, Tracy talked about that, um, aligning it to the impact that the volunteers are making rather than because um, what organizations often report on is uh, volunteer hours. Um, there's a certain dollar amount matched to the hours and and that's all good you know to put it in perspective mm. but really um they, they are not they're not in paid roles so it's just a just a something guesswork um but aligning it to the impact so what are they actually helping us achieve um makes it a very different picture first yeah. for the volunteers to engage them and get them on board rather mm. than engaging them as a you know, standing at the corner giving directions, yes. um, engaging them in how they're making a difference to the customer. Um, that's a very different way, but also for the staff in the organization to get them around and especially the leadership to show them actually what's the difference then. Yes. Look, there's many times I've worked at events where I've been chatting to someone in the workforce and you know, this, when they tell me what their background is, I'm thinking, why, why, why have you been put in this role? Now, sometimes people actually want to have a break from what their day job is. So they do actually want to, so that's different if they've chosen. But the untapped talent that is sitting in your workforce, that every day or every week works or every year walks into your event or your organisation, the skills, the lived experience, the insights that we don't tap into because there's, volunteer a they go and do that task and that's often how some organizations just see them um, you know we're really missing a, a big opportunity there now we've got some time for questions so if you've got any questions for our panel please pop them in the chat function um, Yana what do you think when do you think events you know will start well do you think events will really sort of see that shift do you think it'll be a case of It'll just, you know, because event planning has, will be happening so fast once they get the go-ahead to run an event, it'll be back. Or do you think they're starting to understand, let's review it now? I think it'll come down to the leadership, really, um, to be honest, um, and the willingness to, to have a look at that. I think the opportunity is that... Um, what I always say is volunteers are part of your community. You know, um, it's you have your event participants and you have other stakeholders and you have volunteers and it's all one community and usually it's a local community and um, if we see it more like that then it makes a lot more sense to engage volunteers in a different way yes i think the opportunity is there now to include it in the planning and the beauty with events is it's like often they are annual events and they um have the opportunity every year to incorporate a different thing to, to change the volunteer program at least slightly contrary to what Tracy talked about you know the organization keeps just running so change is um, perhaps a little bit harder especially with large organizations um, so for events it's a great opportunity in so many ways to adjust that um, I think events are definitely restarting um, I know um, a lot of the art events are planning for next year. Um, the large public events we'll have to see. Um, sporting events have already restarted up in Queensland. Um, some running events. Yes. So um, the roles are changing for sure. Um, and 
I think there's an opportunity to rethink, you know, are the roles actually um, still aligned to the organization, especially when we need to think about how many people can we have on site, yeah. how, um, like, which are the relevant roles and why, why are they relevant, and then communicate it differently. And so I think that can be a really good turning point for events. To Absolutely. And, and, and not just thinking about the task oriented roles at events, but how else. And, and the other big thing that often gets missed um, by people outside of volunteer engagement positions is your volunteer workforce are your ambassadors. Hmm. They are the ones that tell their friends, that tell others in the community about how good your organisation is or how good the event is and you've got to come to this event next year or how good the service is, or know a family that could use, you know, Lord Summers. So if we can manage and engage properly, you know, the power not only by the benefit that they provide in, in the um, insights and the experience and the, the work they do with us, but that they are our ambassadors. And when you think of how many volunteers are involved with organisations, that's a lot of, you know, word of mouth referrals and um, ambassadors happening out there. Mm. Um, so we've got a question here from Renee. What advice would you give regarding ambassadors to physically returning to working within a visitor information centre? The majority of our volunteers are desperately waiting to return to their roles, but our concern during COVID is that they are all in a vulnerable age category. Absolutely. And I might throw to Tracy because... Um, I know that she's probably experiencing this with some that are wanting to come back and how you make that safe environment, particularly in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, look, I think this is a really, this is a really tricky one and it's probably in part going to come down to decisions by organisations. Um, so I know here at Austin Health, we are, are, you know, making sure that what we're, you know, decisions we're making about volunteers are aligned with decisions we're making about staff and all of our staff who are in vulnerable categories have still either been redeployed to other roles or are working from home because we are trying to restrict the amount that they move around in the community. So, and I guess it, it's been, um, I admit it's so much easier for us um, in a health service to really um, conceptualise this a little bit more. It's, it's, it is for us about making sure that everyone at Austin Health is contributing to, you know, having as minimal numbers as we can. And so that is about everybody having the, the fewest number of contacts in their community that they possibly can, particularly those in vulnerable age categories. We know that a lot of um, insurers uh, who insure volunteers um, currently do not provide coverage for volunteers who contract COVID whilst they are volunteering. So while they might get coverage for loss of wage or for medical um, expenses, should they fall over and break their leg while they're volunteering, they won't get insurance coverage. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to figure out from your organisation with your insurer. Um, and I know Volunteering Victoria and other peak bodies and Volunteering Australia are doing some work around this. That's information you need to provide to your volunteers to make a safe decision. Um, and then really, uh, it's a tricky one because I guess there's this sense of control that a lot of organisations have that they want to put a blanket policy in, pay, in place. Um, but then it's really important that we allow volunteers to have self-determination and to be empowered to make their own decisions. Some organisations are making the decision that their volunteers are encouraged to go to their GP to get a letter that they are able to do so. Or it may just be, please go and have a conversation so that you can make an informed choice and come back when you're comfortable with coming back. But as an organisation, you really need to provide volunteers with all of the information that they need to make an informed decision about their particular circumstances. Um, I guess if you're thinking about the Visitor Information Centre, I'm wondering, I don't know if you're with City of Melbourne or, or one of the largest city visitor information centres, how many people are you expecting to be in the city? How many, you know, um, people within their, their kind of 1.5 metres? How are you going to manage that social distancing to keep people away from them? In Melbourne, I know they would have people on street corners. Are you going to do that or are you going to keep them in a booth behind a screen? So there's all those kind of things that you really need to be thinking about before you make decisions about, um, about age. Me personally, I think self-determination is really important. And for me, I yes. was looking where possible to provide as much information as possible and then volunteers make their own decision. Um, but that will be once our own staff. Um, and start coming back to their roles. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's such a, you know, empower them. 
yeah, include them in the conversation. And I think Renee is in a regional area. Um, is you know empower them. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, to join 1400. So, you know, having all that information, having that conversation, empowering them, allowing them to make the decision, but also knowing where you stand with your insurance and, and I guess having a policy so there isn't a grey area on that person has been allowed, but that person hasn't. Um, and I think in those sort of situations, we've got some ambassadors or guides here at, at the hospital. And one of the things that we're really conscious of, we've got two volunteers who will come at the next, when the next set of restrictions let, um, kind of drop out. And one of the things that we've noticed that we're going to have to provide training on is how do you confidently manage your personal space and your 1.5 metres? How do you train people to... Um, make sure that that distance is created. Do you encourage people to step back? Do you give them a script? Do you ask people, you know, and what happens if that situation escalates as well? Because I know here that, there, you know, we do get people in the door who get really angry or who don't believe in it or who've already had so many hurdles to come into the hospital. So there's all that stuff we need to think about as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tim, you mentioned that the, the door might be, you know, knocked down by the committee wanting to come back and you've got volunteers of all ages. How are you working through that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the first first priority is uh, the health and safety of all of our volunteers and, and, and that equally of our uh, participants. So we would be taking a very cautionary approach to return. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think we've been able to, um, uh, I, I say mildly satisfied because, um, you know, uh, Zoom certainly doesn't completely replace the, the social connection of being in the same, same room or environment, but we've been able to uh, satisfy our, uh, uh, you know, uh, different groups and, 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 and partners within our um, uh, virtual connections and, and, and whatnot. Uh, again, there's a lot of eagerness to get back out in, the, in, the, in, a, in a COVID norm uh, world, uh, but uh, you know the the situation that we're in, caring for you know um, uh, high risk uh, young people, and the the nature of how we uh, participate as well with breaking down barriers for diversity is diversity from a lot of different uh, areas. So we're we're, we're we'd be um, uh, well placed to spread connection, <laughs> but equally. Uh, we don't want to be spreading, uh, uh, you know, COVID. So I think we're going to be taking a very cautionary approach um, but moving forward. Excellent. Well, we're almost out of time. Thank you so much to all our panellists for joining us today. I've popped some information and links in the chat function, including a masterclass that Fetching Events will be running in a couple of weeks called Building a Strong volunteer workforce or building your strong volunteer workforce and there's actually an, a discount code in there as well that you can access to get a discount but what I wanted to share with you was a, a wonderful um, I guess sort of um, coming together of minds that was led by James Green from St John of God in Bendigo part of the Love Network when he went about trying to find what's a collective noun for a group of volunteers and uh, did some um, unofficial research, I guess we'd probably say, and conversations. And what he came up with, I think is just beautiful and I wanted to share it and perhaps end on this today. So his collective noun for a group of volunteers, a constellation. As individuals, volunteers are stars, but collectively they make up an amazing constellation for our organisations and our community. They inspire us and remind us that we are all part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think that just, I, I just love that. And I think we should, we need to get that word out there. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, as I said, I've popped links in there. Um, so find out more about Tracy's blog or CVA if you're interested. More information about the programs that Lord Summers run and you can connect with Yana on LinkedIn as well. And of course, as I said, fetching events and keep an eye out um, have a check out our two hour online masterclass. It'll be um, a Zoom meeting, so cameras on. It'll be small groups and it'll be interactive. So we hope you can join us. Thank you. We wish everyone a safe and wonderful weekend and all the best for uh, 2020, but we hope we cross paths with you all soon. So thanks again to my panelists, Tracy, Tim and Yana. It's been wonderful having you all here and we wish everyone a great day.
Thank you. Bye.